So I'm I'm going to I'm going to put some live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Taylor McElmore. Taylor, are you ready to be great today? Yes, I am. Let's do it. Taylor is a venture builder, scale operator, community connector, and investor. He is a managing director of the Techstars Workforce Development Accelerator. Previously, he was managing director of ABLE, a venture and product studio. While at ABLE, he was co-founder and investment lead for Codable, a coding school in Latin America. Taylor serves on the Colorado Banking Board, and Taylor is the founder and board director of, for Patriot Bootcamp, a nonprofit that supports military veteran and military spouse entrepreneurs. Taylor graduated from Davidson College. Taylor, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So Taylor Davidson College, that's the same school that Seth, um, Steph Curry went to in North Carolina? He did. Steph, uh, you know, Impressive basketball player, also very impressive um, human. You know, does a lot of good work in, in the community. And uh, Davidson's fortunate to have him uh, in, in the alumni. And uh, a lot of people know Davidson in the, you know, nationally, but definitely in the Southeast. Um, and Steph made us even more well-known. So uh, we're, we're appreciative to the, the person that he is in representing our school. It's always good to hear, when you hear like a person that's public and known figure is actually a good person also. That's always good to hear. Yeah. No, I, and, and I don't want to misrepresent it. I, I don't know him well or anything like that. We had a, you know, he goes in the category of uh, interacted with him a couple of times back at school. My guess is he doesn't remember me one bit, uh, but uh, he actually did something really special. He, uh, and, and then with his business partner, a gentleman named Brian Farr, who's really nice. Um, he actually, they, they helped my wife who works with children uh, that are um, undergoing treatment for cancer. Um, they actually set up so that one of those um, one of those young young people that was you know working through some really tough cancer treatment could meet Steph, and that was that was her dream come true. Um, and Steph makes time for stuff like that, and that's you know for a busy person who is uh, wildly successful, um, he still makes time for the important stuff to connect with people. And I, I have a ton of respect for that. And um, Bryant helped me back make that happen. So we need uh, we need more steps in this world. Definitely. So Taylor, talk about Codable. What's the idea behind Codable and why Latin America? You know, something like FBU here in the United States, Africa, Europe, Asia. Like, why? First, why Codable and why in Latin America? Sure. So, you know, the, the genesis for um, Codable really goes back to the, the company that we built it um, from and wh where it was launched, which is a company called Able. It's a product and venture studio based out of uh, headquartered out of New York, has a large presence in San Francisco, uh, and I worked with the CEO there, Mike Potter, to um, help scale and build that business. One of the things that we decided early on um, was that we really wanted to explore the global market for talent. We're obviously big believers in the, the talent markets here in the United States, but uh, we ascribe to that statement that um, opportunity is not distributed evenly, but talent um, is. Uh, and so we think that there is so much need in this world to figure out how to connect people um, so that they can have great jobs, so that they can do great work, they can earn livings that support themselves and their families. Um, and that's really a global vision. Um, we found our way towards South America through some of our network, um, started hiring uh, software engineers down there. Um, down in Lima, Peru, where we built a team and we just gained a deep appreciation for the culture, the people. Um, Peru is a wonderful country. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's massive in size. I think the, the comparison that I, I've heard is that it's approximately the same um, land mass size as Texas. So very large, but hugely diverse ecosystem and people. It's everything from uh, the Pacific Ocean to deserts to the Andes at the peaks, um, all the way to the headwaters of the Amazon. So it's just this amazing place. Um, and we really connected with the people there. And as we were hiring more and more people, not only from Peru, but from the region as well, Colombians, Venezuelans, um, a variety of other people from parts of Latin America, uh, we saw that, that that sort of ecosystem was strong in, ter in terms of its total number of people, but still very much evolving and growing in, uh, with regard to technical um, resources and just, the, the, the capabilities of people to um, jump into a tech profession and then move into a real global economy 
um, and demand for tech talent. And we, we are the furthest thing from um, the people to start the first coding school. Those have been around for a long time. There's a lot that we have a ton of respect for. Um, and we really borrowed a lot from those people. And that's what I respect about that community is a lot of those leaders are very open-minded about sharing. So um, Jeff Casimir from Turing.io, which is a great coding bootcamp and coding school. Um, uh, he was open in helping and sharing. Um, and so we built it, but just tried to focus on how does this fit well into the community of Lima, Peru and, and broader Peru. The really exciting thing is that when you help people get to that junior level of software developer and access a much more global talent market, um, their opportunity to you know, not only hopefully do a career that's meaningful to them, but access to strong earnings is significant jump from the average minimum wage in Peru. Uh, I, I haven't checked the statistics recently, but you know, the average minimum wage uh, in Peru is somewhere around $200 a month, um, you know, converted from their currency to US dollars. Um, it's not a lot. Right. Like, that's a that's a hard amount to get by on, but a lot of people do it. Um, and our school was built for both supporting that community because we believe a richer technology community in Lima and broader Peru increases our chances back there uh, when I was part of the ABLE team of making ABLE successful um, and hire more great people. And that that's a virtuous cycle. So it was trying to support the community and also build a great strategic pipeline of um, talent that some of which we were hopeful would want to join ABLE. Uh, fortunately, we were right in that. Um, we you know, have graduated our first class through that coding school. Uh, the second one is underway um, and more to come. It's, it's got great leadership. The people that are going through it are amazing. And the stories of the people are the best part, in my opinion. It's just hungry people that just thirst for these great challenges of building technology products. And they can go through this coding school and in many cases, double their compensation from where they started in a matter of six to eight months um, and have a career trajectory from there. And in many cases, even more, like we've seen some income uh, level jumps in that six to nine month period of 5X, 10X, some even more than 10X. Um, and that's, you know, that's truly uh, life-changing and that, you know, it's on them, right? They're the ones doing the hard work. Um, but the school helps facilitate that, and hopefully that has impacts and ripple effects for their families um, in that broader community, um, that uh, the, the national ecosystem of technology improved. So that's why we did it. Um, it continues to be very strong, and uh, I have high hopes that it'll do, uh, deliver a lot more very meaningful impact to people. Taylor, how often you get you to go down there and visit in person? Uh, back when I was at ABLE, I, I would get down to Peru quite a bit. And this was obviously uh, our pre-COVID um, existence now, but I, I would get down to uh, Peru on a pretty regular basis, usually about quarterly, uh, to spend time with our team down there and um, engage with uh, you know, the, the people that were really were the core of launching this. So, you know, um, Andres Benavides is the general manager that really helped found and launch the project. That he was the one doing that work on the ground uh, with a bunch of instructors from the ABLE team um, that helped actually teach the, the technology um, curriculum. So spent a lot of time down there. Love it down there. Good people. Like I said, the other thing too, it's, uh, it's, um, it might be a little controversial to some of the other uh, Latin Americans, but in my opinion, it's the, the best food in um, all of South America. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the country might have something to say about that, huh? <laughs> And Taylor, uh, it's, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, after you, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Hey, Taylor, so, you know, everyone talks about, you know, the tech talent shortage in the United States. Is that just in the United States? Is this software development tech talent shortage or is this across the world, what, what you, you're seeing? Uh, it's, I, I think it, the answer is yes, all the above. Um, and you can see that in multiple places. Um, you know, demand is, Demand used to be more localized, right? It was my company is based here and I want to hire, you know, in this case, uh, technical talent, software engineers, what have you, that can come to my office. Um, that demand, you know, so was then localized to mainly technology hubs and then generalized across the, the broader economy in, in most cities. Um, but, you know, that's why there is such strong demand in places like New York and San Francisco. And you can see that in how much people are getting paid, um, you know, 
software engineers with only a few years of experience are making amazing money. Now, that said, it's very expensive to live in a city like San Francisco. Um, but one of the interesting trends that was already occurring and has been accelerated by, by COVID is just remote work. There's actually companies now that are purposely trying to diversify their workforce um, uh, outside of those centers. Um, lots of reasons uh, that companies are considering it. Some is cost advantage of other markets. Some is that they believe that there's a lot of talent that's just not in San Francisco, which is completely true. And why have locations slow down building the best team? Um, so as those thoughts continue to grow, um, I think you add on top of what has been decades of you know, just the demand for outsourcing, um, which has been there and which, which can be onshore, can be offshore. But you just have this global trend of demand being able to be addressed by talent in more and more places. In my opinion, that's a good thing. It gives people choice. Um, it makes it a more open market. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is what, you know, kind of my response is, yes, it's, it's a U.S. thing. Yes, it's certain cities, but it's also global, both on the demand. Um, and then we address it by having global supply open up. So, uh, you know, I, that, that's something that I think is really exciting. Um, I think it's part of the, the promise of this interconnected um, global world that we've been, uh, you know, a part of and, you know, has lots of different influence and factors on it. But the more that great talent can find great opportunity, this world's a better place in my book. Hey, Taylor, let's next talk about Patriot Bootcamp. But, but first we get started, I, I want to thank you for doing Patriot Bootcamp. It's a great, great organization. And I'll probably get slammed for this, but there are so many veteran organizations out there who say they help veterans, right? Uh, and some of those scams, some of them try their best intentions and don't work out. But yours is actually doing something for veterans and, and helping us out a lot. So I really want to thank you for that. So the question is, I mean, because you're not a veteran, correct? No, sir. So did you get any pushback for, for starting a veteran organization, not being a veteran, where the idea came from? And just, I mean, how does it come about? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll maybe answer the question in two ways. You know, one is that specific one of did I did I get pushback? Um, you know, there have been a few times where people have kind of said, you know, uh, maybe not as directly, but who who are you to start this, um, or who are you to be involved with this? Um, but that is a small small minority. Uh, I think a lot of times people ask the same question you did. They say, hey, you're, you're the founder of Patriot Bootcamp. Did you, did you serve? And I, you know, I always try to be extremely transparent with that, but no, I didn't. Um, but the actions of the organization, um, the actions of the collective community now that are the alumni and the, you know, the partner organizations that are in it, I think speak for our intentions, which is, um, we need to be very respectful that there is a veteran and military spouse and broader military community. And like, those are the people that have served. Hopefully we also create ways for everyone to support them that has genuine intention to do so. Um, because while there are a lot of amazing veteran and military spouse entrepreneurs that other veterans and military spouses can lean on, um, there's honestly not enough to solve all the challenges um, and to get you the best path to whatever you're trying to solve as an entrepreneur. So by this just perspective of not, um, you know, I don't say this out of criticism, but uh, because some organizations are, it's, it's sort of, you know, for veterans, by veterans. And like, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense in certain scenarios. But our goal is to say, hey, it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. We need to help you get the best shot. And that means you need to talk to the best and the smartest people that can get you connected with the best opportunities and um, the strongest resources. And that very well, that those people might not be veterans. They might not be military spouses. And as long as their values aligned with why we're all here, um, of creating this community of support for serving those that, that have served, that's great. That's fine. And that's generally what people express to me, um, is that they see uh, the alignment of values and intention. Um, and that resonates. And that makes it, you know, it's kind of a, let's just make the tent bigger and invite people in approach. So. You know, that's kind of the first piece I, I you know, I, I'll share the, the quick sort of origin story because I, I think it's pretty interesting um, uh, of how the idea got started. Patriot Bootcamp began just as a blog post. Uh, I was leading a startup, um, and, as we just discussed that, you know, I, I did not serve, but I come from a family that, that um, has many people that have served. Both of my grandfathers um, were uh, career members of the Air Force. I had um, an uncle in the Navy, another um, uncle that was in the Army. My father-in-law served in the Navy. So, you know, that's, you know, that's 
uh, a unique story for us, but also not a unique story for American families, right? So many of us share that common bond of, of even if we didn't serve, that family members did. Um, and I, I thought to myself as I was writing this blog post, what do I want to write about? And I was watching the news and it, it showed that the president um, back in, the, in 2010 had extended the tax credits for hiring veterans. I said, that's great. We should do more. What can we do as an entrepreneurial startup community to support more veterans and military spouses becoming startup founders? These are our leaders, both at home and internationally. Um, and there's a deep history ever since the, um, the founding of our country, honestly, of veterans being entrepreneurs. Um, how do we continue that in this wave of digitally focused, high scale technology startups? Um, let's do more. And the blog post basically said that. And I tweeted it out at David Cohen, the founder and uh, managing partner at Techstars. And he, he responded, I, he and I had never met. Um, and he just said, great idea, what do you think we should do? Um, and in classic David fashion, he transitioned what was sort of an idea to challenge me with the, this is great, but how are you gonna take action? How are you actually gonna make a difference with this? How can we make this part of a stronger community to, you know, both be someone who's responsive, which I really respect of, you know, uh, you know, a really successful, busy person, but also to sort of uh, catalyze me. And, and he does this with a lot of people uh, to see if we're going to if we're going to receive that and do something with it. Um, and when when David and I went back and forth a few times on, on some ideas of what what we could do, eventually said, this is great. But like you need you need to step forward and take a a leadership position in this i'll support you techstars will support you go for it um and like i couldn't say no to that like it was a, such an exciting opportunity to collaborate with david the techstars community and to do it in a place that um, i had so much passion and support of just serving those who had served given you know my family history um, and so we put together the first event um and you know it just kind of rolled we knew that we could uh, get great speakers. We, th we thought we could deliver on bringing in great mentors. We were really hopeful that people were going to apply. They did. Um, and then we were really hoping that they'd show up and they did. Uh, and when they did, this magic happened. Uh, people were just buzzing and talking and just digging into, you know, sharing with each other what businesses they're trying to build and trying to learn how to build the strongest path towards success on that. Um, and towards the end, two things happened. One is uh, multiple people came up to me and said, hey, by the way, just so you know, we started an email list so that we're all in touch. And it was the, kind of that moment where in retrospect, it's kind of like, you know, light bulb goes on. I, I should have known. The whole point was community. Like we, we run events um, and we, we do these educational things and we focus on mentoring. But the truth is that the core of Pager Bootcamp is community. Um, and it took that first event for me to catch up and see it. They saw it before I did it. And then we've just built upon that. And then the second is, uh, you know, in, in classic, like sometimes product market fit just um, sneaks up and bites you. Uh, a bunch of people came up to me and said, so when's the next one? And my, my honest answer was, I have no idea. I haven't even thought about it yet. Um, and, you know, fast forward to today, we have a professional team that runs the organization. You know, I'm, I'm the founder and I'm the board member, but I don't make it happen day to day. Jen Pilcher is the CEO along with um, Cherry Rice, who's the chief operating officer and the rest of their team. And they're the ones that make it happen. Um, and they're the ones that make sure that that community is vibrant, alive, and supported. Uh, and we've done, I honestly, I've, kind of, I've lost track. I think we're um, getting in the direction of 20 some events. We're close to having worked with a thousand uh, plus veterans and military spouses. Um, and they've gone on to raise hundreds of millions of venture capital dollars, create thousands of jobs. Um, and most importantly, they're, you know, they're, they're creating their own story. They're, they have agency in building their future, their employment, and doing so for other people. And that's that's the most meaningful part. And I know I'm a city leader of Buck Labs in Seattle. And one of the challenges here is like a lot of veterans, you know, we lived in a bubble, right? We were on Fort Lewis, Fort Bragg, these different stations, and we never leave, right? So the challenge is get them out of the military base and have them go networking like in different places right? and expose them that was a challenge. And then you talked about uh, the, the military spouse too. I don't think people realize what a challenge is for military spouses, right? I mean, because most military spouses have college degrees, I mean, they're, they're underemployed. I think the unemployment rate last time I checked was like 20% for military spouses, way higher than anyone else. And the third I could tell when I was at station in Vicenza, Italy in the early 2000s, so the commissary, like the grocery store on base, you don't know. So you had the cashers right in the baggers. Not in the cash, but the baggers were all military spouses with master's degrees. I'm like, this is, this is craziness, right? And it, I don't think it's gotten any better for them. 
it's hard. I, you know, I, um, I'm not sure if the statistics are moving in the right direction yet. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the things that are changing in this world of openness towards remote work, more flexible work built around family life, especially, you know, the, a lot of those uh, military spouses are caregivers for children or multiple children. So add on top of that, that like you said, uh, the average military spouse um, has a higher level of education than the average American. Um, yet their job opportunities are significantly more challenging. It's just, it's lost opportunity of, you know, once again, we think of who is serving and the people, you know, that are, you know, in, in, in the various branches of our military, the ones directly serving, but the military spouses are the ones providing that support for them. And in my opinion, that is, a, you know, an equally important form of service um, that we just need to respect and understand. And it's, it's not the same as, as serving directly the military, but it's one that we need to respect um, and really cherish and therefore find ways to get them opportunity, more flexible jobs, more remote positions. It's such an opportunity to get great talent. There's actually a, a wonderful company called Instant Teams that does nothing but this. They try to connect that community with amazing opportunities. So yeah, I'm a big believer in that. And I, I need to you know, give credit where credit is due. Actually, our current CEO, um, Jen, when she went through the first Patriot Bootcamp program, uh, she actually emailed me and she was like, hey, because our, our, we opened it up and it was Patriot Bootcamp, apply here. And she said, are military spouses you know, eligible to apply? Because not, not every program accepts them. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I hadn't thought about it until the question came in. I um, don't deserve any credit for thinking um, proactively about it. Um, and I thought about it for a second, and at least for our organization, our values, there was only one right answer, which is, you know, we are serving the, you know, that, that broader, and in my opinion, the complete definition of the military family, which is active duty, veteran, and, and military spouses. Yeah, I think the challenge to us, too many companies out there who are like, have the, have the mindset, well, you're going to leave in a year or two years anyway. I'm not going to hire you. I'm not thinking about, yeah, if he's going to leave, he or she's going to leave in one or two years, but you're going to have this great person for two years that's going to improve the value of your company. And some people have not got past that mindset yet, unfortunately, I don't think. Yeah, and even when they do, you know, um, when they get, when they move from place to place to support, um, you know, their spouse that's serving. Like as long as there's more alignment with great remote work opportunities, it doesn't matter, right? In fact, it, like you know, I I have heard wonderful stories about how military geographic diversity helped companies. So you, you might have started working with someone, you know, a military spouse that was you know stationed there near you in the in the Pacific Northwest, and maybe they get um, stationed in uh, Japan next time. Well, you could think of that as a problem, or you could say, guess what? We have more time zone coverage now. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, you have to be creative and flexible in your thinking, but I think most of what is traditionally been perceived as problems are actually really meaningful opportunities. I agree. So Taylor, let's switch to tech stars. I think most people know what tech stars is. My question for you is what is a business of tech stars? Is a business of tech stars like to expose as many people as possible to entrepreneurship? Is it to make a social impact? Is it to like get as much money back from your investments in companies? What is the business of Techstars? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it, it very much touches on all those pieces. Um, and I, and I, and I, I don't say that to sort of like, I don't think that's a cop out answer. Um, and, and the reason is that all of those things that you just mentioned are um, self reinforcing if they're done right and connected in the right ways. And, and make each other stronger and creates a very positive feedback loop. You know, so, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, this is what we say, like our, our, our vision is that uh, we want to create a more sustainable, inclusive and connected world. Like uh, the word startup isn't in there. Um, you know, the, you know, the term founder isn't in there, but we believe that entrepreneurship is a big part of that. And our mission is to make innovation accessible to everyone everywhere. Still, like, it's not, hey, we do startups or we're just investors. It's that we believe that there's a transformative power of innovation. And one of the ways to drive innovation um, is startup companies that are so agile and great at finding new solutions to big, hard problems, um, being able to change the world uh, in a really positive way to open up, you know, connectivity and borders that previously weren't there. So, you know, those are our driving elements. Now, the question of like, what is our business, right? Which could be, you know, repositioned as um, potentially how do we make money? Um, you know, we, we, we do that in different ways. We are investors. Uh, we invest 
in almost 500 companies a year through our accelerator programs. But we also support community um, development because we know that that's part of building ecosystems that support and help grow strong startups um, and, and st strong technology innovation. So, you know, we do, uh, we provide support to um, and enable volunteers to lead startup weekends around the world. Uh, we, we even recently did one in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, we, we've done them uh, all across the United States, Asia, Africa, um, Latin America. Uh, so it's all of those elements. Community connects to startups. Startups are what drive innovation. We invest in that innovation. Um, we work with sponsors and partners that also care about that. Um, and at the end of the day, it helps us pursue that mission that, you know, ABLE is, uh, or that um, the Techstars is that global platform for investment and innovation um, that helps entrepreneurs go from inspiration to IPL. Taylor, do you think that in the school system, we're doing a good enough job of, of talking about entrepreneurship in like high school, junior high? And if not, do we, is, I'm guessing we need to improve that, don't we? I, I think so. Um, and, it, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. It's everything from uh, that more entrepreneurs will be the innovators that solve hard problems. So you know, can kind of go to that core element that I was just talking about. But I would go further that just I think entrepreneurship has such a valuable place in education, even if someone doesn't decide to go found a company. I think, you know, as they mature into other uh, career paths, I would much prefer to have entrepreneurial minded employees versus ones that are not. To me, being an entrepreneur is trying to um, deeply understand a problem, um, creatively build a solution that creates a lot of value for whoever has that problem. Um, and many times as an entrepreneur, uh, you're trying to address a problem where it's so big and so audacious that when you start solving it, you don't have all the resources in place to solve it yet. But you're willing to be intelligent. You're willing to be um, iterative in your solution development. Um, that mindset um, that leads to great founders and the building of great companies, um, you know, it might not apply everywhere. I don't want to overstate it. But you know, I, everything I just said, if, if I'm hiring people for a team that I'm leading, I want them to have those skills. So the idea that at the very least, um, the kids going through our school system have exposure to that um, seems really valuable. I think there's some programs out there that I, you know, that I've um, either seen, you know, learned about and or, um, uh, you know, heard reports of that I, I think are making great strides in that direction. But um, we could go further and I think it would be valuable. Taylor, so I think most people involved with startups or tech or trying to raise funds have heard, have heard of Techstars, YC Combinator, AngelPad, but there's actually, I mean, there's probably like hundreds or maybe even thousands of, you know, incubators, accelerators out there. And I, I carry this term wrong, but I think they're, they're y'all are graded by a, a gold standard, silver standard, if, I, if I'm getting that right. Can you talk about that and how y'all got graded, if that makes any sense? I, you know, I'm not in a great position to, uh, comment on that mainly just because I, um, I mean, I've read some of that stuff too. There are different organizations that have, you know, done everything from academic research on accelerators to, you know, um, more news publications trying to come up with ranking systems. And I think all that's good, right? Like they're trying to provide um, visibility and transparency to what are the strengths and the weaknesses of every program for, for founders and entrepreneurs. That's great. Um, we need more of that. Uh, it's, you know, we all are working to tell our story and the more that there's data and transparency, the better off we all are. Um, to me, you know, I, I, what, I, what I can speak to is that the odds when you start an, um, uh, as an entrepreneur and you're building a startup are against you, honestly. And, you know, there's a variety of different studies out there, but, you know, you kind of settle into the classic line that like one out of 10 startups make it. Said the other way, nine out of 10 fail. Um, those are stark odds. So what does that mean, um, you know, for you as the entrepreneur, right? The, the way that I like to talk about it is you need to work on changing your odds. There's different ways to do it. Um, number one, you got to have a great founding team. Um, and you can be a solo founder. That, that very much is a path. But um, both having walked the founder path, I, I personally believe it is very important to have a co-founder, both for complementary skills, but just also a partner for what is 
um, a business journey, but also an emotional journey. There's just so many ups and downs. Um, and I think it's important to have a, a support partner in that. Um, has to be a good fit. It's not always easy to find that person. It's a relationship you have to work on, but that's critical. Um, and then it's once you're starting off without enough resources to actually you know, achieve that audacious goal that you've set out to if you're really going after system level changes as a startup founder. And so the question is, who are you going to bring in along the way to help you get there? And so what I do know is that at Techstars, um, you know, we have over 2,000 companies that have, um, you know, gone through our accelerator programs. And uh, I believe the current percentage is 86 or 87 percent are either still active or have been acquired. Um, and that's a very different percentage from that one out of 10 make it. So um, there's lots of ways to measure it, but a, the path of a founder can feel very binary. It's either, you know, did you make it? Did you stay alive or did you not? Um, and what we focus on is putting the right mentors, because we use that mentorship driven accelerator model around the startup founder to support them, to help them change those odds. Now, they're the one who has to do the work. Um, they're the one who's going to, you know, build that impressive company and they deserve the credit because they're doing that work. Um, but how can we help that founder basically shrink time down, make two years of progress in 13 weeks? That's what we talk about with our accelerators. Um, and that's why I think that they're um, very valuable and why um, you know, our founders uh, recommend to other founders that they should join Techstars Accelerators. Taylor, so you just took over as manager director of the new um, accelerator in, in the Boulder Denver area, the Workforce Development Accelerator that focuses on the, on the future of work. Can you talk about that, what's going on with that right now? Yeah, definitely. So I'm very excited to have joined Techstars as a, you know, a team member. I've interacted with Techstars in lots of other capacities. Uh, you know, for example, uh, Patriot Bootcamp was actually founded in partnership with Techstars. They, you know, we, we, they're a co-founder of helping tech, uh, of, of Patriot. Techstars is a co-founder for Patriot Bootcamp. So, you know, I uh, have had that interaction. Also, I, I was the CEO of a, a startup that went through Techstars Boulder program back in 2013. So I've, I've seen it on the founder side and I couldn't be more excited to be in this position. You know, I, I think of myself mostly as a builder, venture builder, community builder. Um, you know, a lot of what I do also is on that investment side, but in my heart of hearts, I'm a builder. I just love helping build things and supporting others in how they build things. And that's why I love this, this position. Um, we're actually the fourth accelerator in the state of Colorado for Techstars. Techstars has, I believe, 46 or 47 um, active accelerators globally. Um, and the four here in Colorado include the, the, the very first one, the Techstars Boulder program. Also, the Nature Conservancy Accelerator, which does amazing work around sustainability. Uh, and then also the Western Union Accelerator, which focuses on um, finance, uh, financial technology and fintech. Um, uh, great managing directors of all those programs. And we're fortunate that we're as the fourth program, there's not only Techstars headquarters here in Colorado, but that network of three other programs um, that are great. So we're, we're joining a party more than anything else. And we're grateful for that. Uh, our focus is uh, workforce development. So that's, I'm the managing director of the Techstars Workforce Development Accelerator. Um, it's a program that we're doing in partnership um, with Zoma Lab, which is a family office out of uh, Denver, Colorado, that invests a lot in the education uh, and workforce development space. Uh, the other partners are um, Strata Education Network, a national nonprofit that um, focuses on creating greater economic uh, mobility for those that have the least in this country. Um, and then Colorado Thrives, which is a group of 13 CEOs uh, that are here in Colorado of large companies that are dedicated uh, to workforce uh, viability for a stronger Colorado. So the, the great part is that we have all the Techstars network globally, but just the strength here in Colorado. We have uh, these partners um, and we're looking to find startups uh, that are um, in the pursuit of enabling human potential through work. That's the way I like to define what we're looking for. People that um, see the, the impact and value that um, careers, employment, um, how people work can have. So we, we invest in a wide spectrum, everything from some education technology that feeds into how people enter the workforce to companies that are connecting supply and demand. Uh, and then also um, uh, solutions for employers. How do you find the right people? How do you uh, hire them? How do you retain them? How do you help them grow? And I would say overall, the themes that really define the companies we look to work with are, are human ones. Uh, 
the workforce journey is a human one. Um, and so what we want is companies helping build agency as people decide what career they want to take. Um, agency is um, supported by having visibility and transparency about what their options are and how to get between those different points. Um, there's not enough of that. So it's not an easy market to navigate, especially in a time where we have so much unemployment. And then um, the other piece of when we work with more employer focused solutions, uh, it's not just how does this make a company more money? It's not just, hey, what are all the cool new things in the future of work that you can do for the sake of doing them? Um, I believe that technology is a tool. The question is what can you do with it? So the lens I bring is what companies are building in that future of workspace that combine mutual success for the employee and the employer. If a company is a startup is really building something that hits that note, that's when I get excited. Hey Taylor, I, I saw recently that you're you're trying to bring on two nonprofits to apply. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for highlighting that. We uh, we're following the standard TechStars model that ten for-profit companies will go through it, but in partnership with our friends over at Colorado Thrives, um, we're going to bring on two nonprofits uh, to participate in the program, and applications are still open for that. So the for-profit application um, process closed in July, and we're going through our selection and diligence process right now. Uh, but on the nonprofit side, it's still open, and um, applications will be open for uh, about another three weeks. Um, and we're excited because in this workforce development space, um, solutions do come from the for-profit space. They come from the government space, and they also come from the nonprofit space. And a lot of times, they come from the collaboration between those types of entities. So that's why bringing in two nonprofits both um, you know, matches the values of the Colorado Thrives organization and Techstars, but also reflects what is the reality of solution development in the marketplace for workforce development. So if there's any uh, nonprofits out there or people that know of nonprofits um, in the workforce development space about helping people get into the right jobs and helping companies employ uh, people, um, we, we'd love to hear from them. We have a, an Ask Me Anything in panel session coming up on Monday, actually. So if you, if you just go to the Techstars workforce development um, page, you can find the links for all of that. So Taylor, next, I want to talk about the, the fundraising part of, of, of startups. What is it that startup founders get wrong about raising funds and the investors in general, from your point of view, from what you've seen? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, fundraising, uh, you know, I think it depends who you ask. Uh, different types of founders either, either love it or hate it. Um, and and I, I understand both perspectives. Uh, it's not easy. Um, and I, and I think that's okay. Uh, you know, it, I don't think it actually would be a very good system if it was overly simple to just get a bunch of money. Um, there should be competition between ideas, founding teams, um, for capital. Um, and similarly, when there's a great idea, uh, more importantly, problem being solved. I'm a big believer and it's more important to focus on the problem than the idea. But when a founding team is superb, and they're really solving a problem for people in a meaningful way, the capital should compete to participate in, the, in their company, it should go both ways. So the things that I think the, the founders and the entrepreneurs, um, especially if they don't have a lot of experience in it, it's just the time involved. It does not happen fast. And the reason um, is uh, multidimensional, but I, I would focus on one that is critical, which is raising capital as a startup is much more about the relationship than the transaction. Um, it's not buying a share of Coca-Cola, which is, I know what they're gonna do mostly, right? It's a big company, they produce Coca-Cola, they do a bunch of other things as well, but to simplify, they produce Coca-Cola, I'm buying a share of that. Um, the startup thinks, and the founders think they know what they're gonna build, and they need to think that they know what they're gonna build, but when they interact with the market, they're gonna adjust, they're gonna pivot, they're gonna learn, they're gonna iterate. So raising capital is that the founders are getting the investment really in the belief of their capability to go through that entrepreneurial process. You know, it's the old Mike Tyson quote, it's, uh, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, and that's true when you put your first version of your, you know, your MVP out there or something, like you, you, you're, you're, out, you're overly optimistic probably because you're an entrepreneur to start with and then you put it out there and the market tells you no that that wasn't right i liked this little bit over here you need, you need to go deeper there but that other stuff that you thought was right no you, you, should, you should scrap that 
And, and that's the point is investors are looking for the person that can go through that process. Um, and it's really hard to figure that out as an investor. Um, and so what as the entrepreneur you can do is put yourself in their shoes. They're not going to probably like, there's a very low likelihood. They're just going to cut you a check in the first meeting because they're not funding your pitch deck. They're funding you and they want to get to know you. So here's my biggest piece of advice is um, open up to allow them to see you as a person. Know that it's going to take some time. Help them understand why you are the person or why you as a founding team are the people to solve this problem. Um, and you know, also hold them accountable. I think one of the challenges as, a, as an entrepreneur is no one's moving at the speed that you are. You're living hour by hour, day by day. No one's going that fast other than you. Um, and they know that on the other side, but there's no reason that you can't hold investors accountable. This, well, the investors don't move enough, or move fast enough statement. Well, you know, just as you would uh, communicate clearly with someone on your team, treat them the same way. Say, hey, what, what is your investment process? How long does it typically take for you to make an investment decision? At the end of the meeting, say, great, what, what are next steps? Um, where are we on that process? When can I expect to hear back from you? What more can I provide to accelerate this process? Um, and every great investor that I know will respond very respectfully to those questions. And if they didn't proactively tell it to you, should share it. And that'll help you understand if they're like, yeah, no, on average, it takes us nine months to make a decision and you don't have nine months. Great. Cut everyone's losses there. Don't waste any of your time or any of theirs. Um, focus on that alignment, that clear communication of expectations on the entrepreneur side. So Taylor, follow, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Taylor, follow up question. What are today's investors getting wrong about the founders of today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there's like, there's not one good answer to that. Um, the truth is that just based on those statistics of most companies not making it and or not returning capital or producing very strong returns to investors because venture capital is um, it's a funny, funny investment game. If you look at the distribution of outcomes, um, it, it, it's what, uh, what is called a power law distribution. Um, and it means that there is this sort of one, like one leg of a, of a curve that describes that most of the returns on their investments sit pretty close to either making no money or very little money or not enough money for them to, you know, uh, really say that they produced a strong portfolio return. And what it is, is that a few investments that have outsized returns are what drive all of that return for the portfolio. And so... Um, investors are constantly trying to understand that, build their behavior around that, um, because you have to be willing to embrace a lot of risk to find those ones that are really going to outperform and be outliers. I think what investors get wrong um, is just focusing on um, sort of momentum trends. And it's not for the wrong reasons. Every idea has its time and they go in waves and you need to predict that stuff. I like to personally focus more on some of the core skills that I believe differentiate um, the potential for success of a startup. One that I always like to pick on um, is product design. I think a lot of times people think of design as, you know, just where, you know, where are we putting this icon on the page? Is, is, it, is the button blue? Um, those sorts of things. Product design is a, is a whole nother discipline, which is a combination of user experience, um, uh, you know, communication with the user. It does include visual design, um, it, you know, it's interaction patterns. Um, it can include user research. The best products have this deep design thinking understanding of the problem to be solved and also how to solve it for the people that are experiencing it. Um, that is still a differentiating factor. Right. Like I, I've been spending some time through our workforce development uh, accelerator looking at um, human resources technology. Like those tools are still painful to use. Like they're just hard to use. Like product design is barely filtered into that world. Um, Gusto is a great example. If you're like, oh, my God, Gusto is so easy to use. It's like so much more uh, intuitive. You know, and, and you're in this world. You, you know this, too. Like 
I think that there are some companies like that that are doing better things, but like still most of the tools aren't great. Yeah, unfortunately, like, every, unfortunately, every gusto does like a hundred companies or nowhere close to them. Exactly. And like, I have a lot of respect for what Gusto has done, but I also don't think like there's still a lot of room for them to improve too. So I believe that there's these whole segments of technology that, you know, it's like, is, is the product design of, of uh, Snapchat and TikTok and Facebook good? Yeah. Like they've got amazing product designers, but like, how does the rest of the world that runs on really old technology get the superpowers of software that was actually built for humans to get stuff done like that? that is still like such a big opportunity most of the time when you look at a company. Yes. Yes. So uh, Taylor, you know, most VC money is in the Bay area and of course there's New York city, Austin, different areas. H how do we change this or do we want to change it from like all the VC money is located in this one area to make more like more equal distribution or is that something we want or is the system good like it is? Well, I mean, good is a value judgment statement, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's as, as good as it could be. Um, it, you know, the, the capital follows the opportunity. Um, and we need to continue making other ecosystems stronger so that there's more capital in, um, distributed across more markets. Um, th the thing that I would say is uh, step one is every community shouldn't try to become San Francisco. Uh, every community should be focused on um, what is their competitive advantage? This is the same advice that I give to startup founders all the time. Um, this is classic like Peter Drucker management philosophy. It's like, every company has probably one competitive advantage. Maybe some have a couple. If you think you have two or more though, you're probably wrong. So, that might not be true at the community level because communities are much more multidimensional and much more robust and diverse than a startup company, but embrace what your strengths are is the point. Uh, don't try to just be San Francisco or New York or, or Boston or something like that. You know, what makes Denver unique? Well, embrace that. What makes Salt Lake unique? Embrace that. What makes Austin unique? Embrace that so that you have a way to differentiate both for attracting talent because at the end of the day, that's a lot of what drives this opportunity is you need a bunch of smart people around so that they start more companies and they can hire other intelligent, motivated people. Um, and then you need a lot of other elements about just how ecosystems can develop and operate effectively of just openness of sharing, uh, you know, the fact that people are more collaborative versus trying to be more isolated in their interactions. Um, what I would say is I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't think anyone does. But um, there is a really exciting book that just came out that I highly recommend, which is um, The Startup Community Way. It's by Brad Feld and Ian Hathaway. Um, and it dives into this exact thing. It's how, how to architect, how to build strong startup ecosystems and communities. Um, and you know, both with that book that was just published and the previous book that Brad Feld wrote called, the, um, called Startup Communities, there's some great guidance. Um, because the way that we change this distribution of where money is, is the money will follow the opportunity. We need to continue building great entrepreneurial ecosystems that are different, diverse, complementary, competitive, all of those things. Taylor, so founders are told, you know, don't give up, get knocked down, get back up, turn a no to a yes, be resilient. But when should a founder say, you know what, this isn't working for me, I need to stop. When should a founder actually stop? Yeah, I'm going to borrow um, sort of a metaphor that I heard from a, a gentleman. His name's Greg Coleman. He's a Patriot Bootcamp alum. Uh, he also went through Techstars. Um, he's a CEO of a, um, of a fitness app company. Um, super intelligent person. Uh, very, uh, very passionate community builder um, as well. Um, and he was at a Patriot Bootcamp event once, and he talked about this idea of, um, you know, and it was, I think it was a metaphor purposely built for the military audience there, which is you're not going to fly a plane all the way across the Pacific Ocean. Um, I mean, you can now, obviously, but like there's a lot of risk of taking the longest journey first. He said, what you do is you find an island at least halfway, ideally even closer. First, take a jump to that island, then go to the next island, and then go to the next island and make sure that you have safe places to land along the way. Think of the same thing for your entrepreneurial journey, which is um, 
can I really take this jump? And this is me kind of saying, instead of knowing when to stop, think about when you should stop before you get there, um, which is to say, can, am I ready to actually start this company? Great. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe can I start working on this part time? That's a closer island. Maybe I just do this nights and weekends. That's an even closer island. Decide which one you're jumping to um, based on you know, what your needs are in your life. How do you maintain happiness and balance? How do you make sure that you're taking care of those responsibilities to, you know, um, that you might have? You know, do, do you have responsibilities to your family that you need to be thinking about? Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't put those aside and just say, well, I'm just going for it. So I think the first thing is to take this measured approach to say, can I make that jump? And know that there probably will be sacrifices, but just that you've thought about those, that you've weighed those. Um, and then sometimes you can find yourself stuck on an island. Um, and the first thing I'll say is it's, it's okay to stop. Um, this like, you must just push through, like, and you hear all these stories of they had 10 credit cards out, they were all maxed out. And like, you know, I, I mean, those are great stories for, uh, you know, Hollywood movies, but they're such a small percentage. And what about all the people that did do that? And it didn't turn into a success in the rest of their life. They're trying to get out from under that debt. I'm not saying don't keep going. I'm saying make a balanced, intelligent decision. Think about the fact that um, your life, your relationships, um, and things other, other than this company, um, you know, it, it's, it's every entrepreneur's decision, but those things might be more important than that startup, despite the fact that you're so dedicated to it. It's it, like, this is, I still believe, work so hard, push. You, like, people should be optimistic and go for it, but just find balance in that equation um, because it's okay to fail. People don't like to talk about failure, but it happens. I've failed. You know, I've helped build some things that have been successful. I've helped uh, start some things that, that were truly failures. Um, and, it, and it hurts and it's hard and we don't talk about it enough. Um, but I got some great advice from a, a mentor that I have a ton of respect for and someone who's become a good friend. His name's Tom Higley. And in kind of those those waning days of one of the companies that I had that um, that was a failure, you know, he gave me some advice. He said, "It's okay to fail, but fail well." That's um, good advice. And and what? Yeah, it's it, it really was. Um, number one is he was being supportive and he was telling me that like it's okay. There's there's there w you will get to the other side of this, but fail well was important because it was you have to do it with integrity. You have to do it transparently. You have to do it honestly. You have to make sure that, you know, especially as a founder, you're, kind of, you're putting yourself last, even in this horrible situation of this thing didn't work out, but take care of your investors to the greatest and deal you can. Even before, more important that, take care of your employees. Um, take care of your community. Um, figure out how you do the best you can for all those. Be honest, be transparent, be communicative. Um, and you know what? Because if you do those things, uh, every, you know, the, the people that get it will give you a, a, another shot. They'll give you another chance. Um, you know, they, it's part of this, this multi-round game that we play. Um, and, you know, there are some people that have nothing but successes and good for them. That's amazing. Even the people that I think we Id idealize as the most successful have a ton of failures. Um, and I think it's because usually they knew that no matter how hard it was, that they could fail fail well, do with integrity, try again. And Taylor, you just started the um, Workforce Podcast recently. Can you talk about that and the idea behind that podcast? Thanks. Yeah, no, I um, appreciate you mentioning it. So we, yeah, we have a, it's workforcepodcast.com. Um, it's a, in partnership with American Inno, which is a, you know, an organization that has publications like Colorado Inno, uh, Austin Inno, Boston Inno, Chicago Inno. Um, and so we're fortunate that they're sharing it with their audiences. And the whole idea is to explore the relationship of technology um, and work from that human lens. So it, it very much aligns with a lot of the stuff that I'm focusing on these days. And we have great guests coming on, such as Brad Feld, uh, Governor Jared Polis of Colorado, JJ Snow, the CTO um, for AppWorks in the Air Force is going to be a, a guest in the near future. Um, Neil uh, Salis Griffin, Managing Director of Techstar Chicago, talking about everything from diversity in tech to um, you know, how the military is approaching um, the human side of technology, uh, to how innovation is driving COVID response. Um, so it's uh, pretty wide ranging. Um, our goal is that it lands with entrepreneurs and innovators as a way for them to hear other perspectives. So that my, my dream is that 
it's two things. One, hopefully it's interesting and fun for people to listen to. But my deeper dream is that somewhere, someday, there is an entrepreneur and they are listening to the show and they say, oh my gosh, that's an amazing problem that that person just talked about. I want to go solve that. I'm going to build a startup for it. That's my hope is that someday it spurs and catalyzes some startups that way. So I tell you, you have some great guests coming on. But do you have like a super guest? When a super guest means someone like you might be out of your realm, you know, like, uh, you know, you don't have a connection to like, like Elon Musk, Tim Cook, you know, yeah. like a super guest that you, you would love to have on there. It's a great question. Um, yeah, I do have a super guest. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I, I would love, I'm going to go with two because I'm not good at following rules. Um, I would love to have uh, President Bush and President Obama on to talk about what we need to do to address the future of workforce for this country going forward on my podcast. That'd be a, that'd be a great conversation with both of them. Yeah, that would. Taylor, can you share your social media link so people can reach out to you? Sure, thanks. I, I'm at Taylor McLemore on Twitter. Um, you can find me at taylormacklemore.com if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, and the podcast is workforcepodcast.com. Um, uh, Jason, thanks so much for having me on today. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat about this stuff, share some of my stories, and connect with your audience. Thank you for what you do. Yes, thanks, Taylor. And we'll have the links to the social media on our show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode. So, Taylor, we're kind of into a talk. Can you provide us any wisdom or advice on any subject you want to talk about? Sure. Uh, one thing that I, I've been um, really trying to embrace, uh, it's actually one of the values of Techstars, um, which is quality over quantity. I feel like we live in a world dominated by quantity. It's, you know, with this digital world where you're just like, well, we, we could, you know, we could spin that up to a million people or, uh, you know, a hundred million people or something. No, I, I, I really am excited to focus on things where you can start with how do I drive quality? Quality of experience in what I'm building for one user or one client. Um, how do I think about that with how I'm spending my time instead of just like putting a bunch of time against something? Am I thinking about the quality of it? Because in my experience, it's really hard to reverse engineer that after the fact. It's really hard to figure out quality after you've started. So when you start with quality and you stay dedicated to quality, you can scale with quality. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And I would just share that idea for people to think about how it might apply to what they're building, their lives, how they're investing their time. So hopefully that idea resonates. Thanks, Taylor. Taylor, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.